So welcome to the second seminar in our weekly series. Last week we talked about food and farming. Uh, tonight our topic is lakes in a changing climate with Dr. John Small. My name is Clark Mackey uh, and I'm the co-host tonight with Leslie Rudy. We're both members of 350 Kingston. Uh, the other people who are involved in this series are um, Jude Larkin, Gavin Hutchinson, Bob McGinnis, and Mark Sibley. Uh, it's a webinar style thing, so uh, what you're going to be muted for the entire time. Um, and uh, what you can do is if you have any questions for us, you can enter them in the chat, but mostly what you, if you have questions for our presenter, that's where you put them so that uh, Leslie can read them after the presentation is over. The presentation will probably go on for like 20 minutes or so. Um, uh, just to let you know that these seminars are being recorded and they are, we'll post them like a couple of days after on YouTube and you can always get the links from the 350 website. Uh, also, if you have any, if there are any uh, issues that you need to get in touch with us about, uh, our email is there, 350kingston at gmail.com. Uh, that's the best way to get in touch with us. Um, again, as, as most of you know by now, Kingston is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Um, and we acknowledge that settler colonialism remains a problem today as it has in the past. And Tonight we are here talking about climate change and uh, there's a quite a link between settler colonialism and climate change as, as most of you probably know. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight, Dr. John Small. Uh, he is the Canadian Research Chair in Environmental Change at Queen's University. And he founded and co-directs, let's make sure I get this right, the Paleoecological Environment Assessment and Research Lab, otherwise known as PEARL. Um, and he has received a great deal of acclaim over the years uh, and awards for his research, outreach and teaching. And uh, we often hear him or see him um, in the media talking about environmental issues. So uh, welcome, John. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and let you take over. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. Uh, and I think you should, do you see my screen now? <laughs> I'm assuming everyone sees my screen all right. <laughs> yeah, it looks good. I guess you'd be screaming probably by yeah, now. No, no, it looks fine. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. and. Um, of course, this is. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the 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 internet connection will hold. I <laughs> I was just talking. I'm on about five or six Zoom calls a day, and probably about one in ten uh, there is an issue with the internet. Hopefully, that's not going to happen uh, today. If it does, uh, but usually I disappear for about a minute and have to reload. So <laughs> give me at least a minute to try and reload. But hopefully, nothing will happen. And uh, what I was going to talk about today is one of the major. Uh, research areas that our lab deals with, which is looking at lakes. I'm a limnologist, that's a freshwater or a lake biologist uh, or lake scientist. And the things we look at is long-term environmental change. And we look at a wide spectrum of issues, everything from the effects of road salt to acid rain to different types of contaminants. But today I wanna to focus on lakes uh, in a changing climate because uh, climate change is one of these issues that overpowers almost all sorts of other types of environmental problems. And I also like to emphasize a major theme of our lab and a major theme of this talk actually is the importance of time scales. Uh, time is important, history is important. It reminds us of the things we did well, it reminds of things that haven't gone well. And many of the answers that we search for in environmental and ecological issues have issues that deal with timescales. And that's one of the biggest problems we have in environmental and ecological research. 
these are the typical types of questions that we might ask in an environmental or ecological assessment. These have a strong, important policy implications. We want to know what were pre-disturbance conditions. We want to know what conditions were like before humans had a significant impact on the environment. There's many examples of why this is important. I, I cut my, I, one example I like using is I cut my teeth 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, and I guess, on acid rain. Uh, one of the key, key issues in acid rain, you could go to lakes and say in Adirondack Park or Algonquin Park or Sudbury, you could take the acidity levels of lakes, no question the lakes were acidic, but how do you know acid rain made them acidic? The comments or the, the arguments were made by some industries, yes, they're acid, but they've always been acid. Well, the only way you could tell humans were linked to the acidification is if you found out what the acidity levels were like in the early 1800s. Well, that would be difficult. Uh, Sorensen only invented pH in 1909 and no one was measuring the acidity levels of Adirondack or Algonquin Park lakes in the 1700s. You want to know what is the range of natural variability? Uh, climate change, the, what I'm going to be talking about today is a very good example. Uh, no one can deny, or pretty well no one can deny something very strange has happened to the climate but you know, the argument has been, well, that's just part of some long-term natural cycle. How do we know? We need long-term data. Have conditions changed? How much? Just when? Why? Each of these questions has a time component. And that's really one of the most serious issues we have in environmental and ecological work. Now, when it comes to environmental data, of all the data we typically have, temperature data is actually one of our best. Uh, certainly, you know, pH of lakes, we hardly have any data and things like that. With climate, of all things, which is not too bad. That's because of these two gentlemen here, uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius. You might not recognize their portraits, but you probably recognize their names. But even here, you realize that the scale is only going back to the 1700s. So even something that we have good data on only is going to go back at best a few centuries. And of course, many places, they weren't measuring temperature in a systematic way. So even with climate, even with temperature, we have real serious problems going back in time. So what do we do? We try and push that monitoring window back in time. We try and, if we don't have direct temperature data or climate data, let's call it climate data or any other type of environmental data, we try and use other types of information. Uh, and when it comes to climate, using one example, um, one thing we could look at is historical records, things that were written down. Uh, I happen to be a wine lover. So one way you can get uh, some information on climate is uh, in France, for example, they have very good records of when uh, the, the, the vines were, uh, were harvested. Uh, that was for taxation purposes. <laughs> but uh, the fact that when you go and collect your grapes on your wine, that actually captures somewhat of a climate signal as well. Uh, using a Canadian example, we have, for example, the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson Bay sent uh, proctors over from Scotland and the Hebrides and so on uh, to, to come to places like Northern Canada uh, and to trade for furs. Uh, they didn't write down what the temperature was, but they often wrote long flowing letters or diary entries, which said like the lake froze today or something. It's not a climate record, but it tells us something about the climate that we can compare to today. Uh, we also have, of course, especially in Canada, Northern Canada, traditional uh, knowledge, whether that be ecological or other types, uh, speaking to elders, or may not be a written record, but at least there's an oral tradition going back in time. <laughs> Uh, there's things like modeling. I'm not going to be talking about modeling. I'm not a modeler, but modeling is one thing that you hear quite a bit about. People not just modeling the future, but trying to model how the climate has changed in the past. What I am going to talk about here uh, is, um, uh, I'm just going to find the spot right here. I am going to be talking about natural archives. And what do I mean by natural archives? All around us on the planet. The earth is monitoring the environment for you. It's, it's recording environmental change. Some of that is in, for example, the trees in my backyard, in the tree rings. There's a whole field of dendrochronology uh, looking at tree rings and so forth. There's things like uh, different types of archives, for example, in corals in the ocean. What I'm gonna be talking about here is a specific type of natural history book, and that's the sediments or the mud at the bottom of a lake. And what the techniques I'm talking about here are gonna be for lakes, but the same techniques are used in the ocean. And the overall, overall idea is, is very straightforward. Um, lakes slowly fill with mud, 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days of the year. Sediment is slowly accumulating at the bottom of the lake. That, that material is coming from two sources. It's coming from outside the lake, things like pollen grains, contaminants, soil particles, but also from within the lake, things like dead algae, dead invertebrates, chemical precipitates. 
day after day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, material is slowly accumulating at the bottom of the lake. It's like a history book. A credible number of fossils and other types of information slowly layered down day by day by day at the bottom of a lake. Now lakes in this part of the world, southern Ontario, usually we get maybe up to three, four meters of sediment and it would go back to about 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago is the time of the last ice age. When the last ice age left, one of the legacies of the ice age is all the lakes we have in southern Ontario. That was the start of the lake's clock. Once the ice was gone, there were several kilometers of ice was gone, slowly the lake filled with water, quickly the lake filled with water, I should say, and slowly started sediment accumulating. The history book started. So in most lakes, we have about four meters of history book going back about 12,000 years. Now I'm gonna be focusing not, some, I'll do a bit on the long term, but mostly I'm focusing back on the last two or 300 years. And to do that, you don't need all four meters. To do that, you only need about the last 50 centimeters of sediment. Uh, and for that, you have, to be, you have to know how to take that history book carefully uh, because that, that surface mud is very, very wet, very watery. And here, uh, my colleague, Brian Cummings, taking core from Lake Opinicon, maybe you might be familiar with in the Rideau Lake system. And here he's taken a core that's about 50 centimeters long. And for most parts of Ontario, that would be the last two or 300 years of sediment. So that's like a history book going back to just before the Rideau Canal was built in this part of the world. And then what we do is by going back in time, we're sectioning. And here, I'm, this material is very wet. So uh, you have to be careful how you do this, but here I'm removing a quarter centimeter. For most lakes, that's two or three years of lake history. Every time I go back, take another quarter centimeter, another, I'm going back in history, back in time. Now this is mud and looks like mud, but in that mud is an incredible library of information. It's really a very surprisingly complete history book of what happened in the lake and outside the lake. For example, things like contaminants from industries, uh, for example, mercury, lead, cadmium, uh, insecticides, DDT, for example, PCBs, PAHs, all that's making its way into the lake. Things like pollen grains, all the plants out there are producing pollen. Anyone who has uh, hay fever knows that, uh, at least at certain times of the year. Uh, different, different plants produce very different types of pollen grains. That pollen is very well preserved in lake sediments. And by reconstructing for what type of pollen it is, you can reconstruct how the terrestrial vegetation has changed. From that, you can get some idea of climate. You can find out where agriculture started, all these other things. Then of course, as I'm a lake biologist, I'm usually interested what lived in the lake as well. Virtually everything leaving in that lake is leaving some sort of fossil. This is done with microscopy. These are highly magnified photographs, but all the little animals, all the little plant-like organisms are leaving fossils in the sediments that we can use to reconstruct the lake. If we know what lived in the lake, we can reconstruct a whole lot of things, what the acidity was, what the nutrients was, to some extent, what the climate was. So it's like a, a paleo environmental meter. And these again are highly magnified, but we're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of pieces of information. And we do that all the time, never mind with lakes. I mean, if I showed you, you know, if I show you different animals, you'll know something about the environment. A, a good example, if I showed you a polar bear, you'd know quite a bit. A polar bear, you know you're in the Arctic, you know you're cold. You know you're in the Arctic, not the Antarctic, because there's no polar bears in the Antarctic. You know you're near the ocean because polar bears eat uh, ring seal. 98% of their diet is ring seal. So if I showed you a polar bear, you'd know a lot. If I showed you a rat, you wouldn't know that much because <laughs> rats live, I mean, you know you're not in the Arctic, but other than that, they live pretty well everywhere else. So some are specialists, some are generalists, but we look at all of these and we can reconstruct how the environment has changed over time. Now, so far, all I've taken is giving you the history book. And I said it's full of information. You can even see some color changes, which are probably pretty important. Uh, but the next step is, how do we know where we are? Uh, we know this core was taken in 2006, so I know that's 2006. But how do I know that's the 1980s? How do I know that's the 1960s? How do I know that's the 1920s? Well, we have other ways of dating the sediments. Now, if I'm going back thousands of years, I'll use radiocarbon or C14. It's the same thing the archeologists use. The archeologist finds a bone, they send it to a radiocarbon lab, they measure how much C14 is there, and it comes back that bone is 5,000 years old or 10,000 years old. That technique doesn't work, works for the thousands of years, but doesn't work for the last 100 or 150 years. Here we typically use another isotope, lead 210. It has a half-life of 22 years. 
And by measuring how much lead 210 is in the sediments, we can actually put dates along this history book. So to keep a Canadian example, that's about 1867, uh, where Canada became a country. Uh, there's the last time the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. That's a lot of sediment has accumulated since then. But we can also say when- uh, Hi, John. Yeah? Sorry to interrupt you. I just have a few people um, asking if it's possible to speak a little louder or to turn your oh. sound up. Speak a bit louder, okay. <laughs> They're just having uh, trouble hearing you. That's interesting. Okay, hold on. Uh, I can hear you okay, but. I'll tell you what. Is this better? Yes. It is better? It's louder for me, yeah. Okay, I will uh, try and speak louder. Normally this is better, but maybe since there are 60 people on, maybe we're losing bandwidth. <laughs> 126 people. 126, <laughs> sorry, okay. So, sorry, just if uh, anyone missed the story. Um, so what I'm just saying, we can actually put dates along the length of a sediment core. Okay, so I'm gonna start this in the far north and I'm gonna bring it back to Southern Ontario. And why am I starting in the far north? Well, partly because a lot of our work has been done in the far north uh, and uh, partly because the far north is extremely sensitive to the effects of climate change. And we often refer to the Arctic as the miner's canary of the planet. Why do we call it the miner's canaries? We're well, just like coal miners used to bring canaries into the coal mines as like early warning indicators. We think the Arctic, we know the Arctic is an early warning indicator of climate change. And that's for a variety of reasons, but the Arctic is especially sensitive to environmental change. And there are many reasons for this, but one of the main ones is what we refer to as albedo. Albedo is reflectivity or whiteness. And I use this analogy. If I went out on a hot August day out uh, on the parking lot behind my house, for example, there was a white car and a black car sitting there. And if I put my hand on each of the two cars, both cars would be hot, but the black car or the dark car would be hotter. That's because it has lower albedo. It's absorbing much more of the sun. The white car is reflecting. It's like a mirror. It is reflecting away heat's energy. The Arctic in its normal state is like the white car. It's full of ice and snow. It's reflecting heat. You start heating up the Arctic. You get less ice and snow. It becomes closer and closer to the dark car, which heats up even more, absorbs more heat, melts more snow and ice, heats up even more. So what we're seeing, this is what we, we saw, call it a positive feedback system. So with some warming, you get even more effects of warming, get even more effects of warming. That's one of the main reasons why places like the Arctic is especially sensitive to environmental, especially climatic change. Now, many of us have heard about the Arctic in its sensitivity, and what you normally hear about is sea ice. That sea ice is declining, and it's definitely declining, and it has all sorts of ecological and environmental repercussions, not least of which is the platform for polar bears. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the ocean sea ice. I'm gonna talk about lake ice because lake ice is also decreasing and it also has a large number of ecological and environmental ramifications. And one good thing about the Arctic is there's lots and lots of lakes. Whenever I see a lake in the Arctic or a pond, I see a potential history book. Uh, by looking at a lake or a pond, I can go and reconstruct how that environment has changed. So first I'm gonna take you to where a lot of our work started and we've been doing this work for 30 years. So we're down here in Kingston, Ontario. And what we typically do, it's not the simplest thing to work in the high Arctic, so just giving you some idea. Uh, we, we go to Ottawa, which is a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, then we take a jet. You can now, when I started, there'd be two jets a week usually out of Montreal, going to what was then for the first year called still Frobisher Bay, now been called a Callowit for some years. Uh, you can do this jet in about three hours. You're in the capital of Nunavut uh, in Iqaluit. Then we, we change planes. We sit there for a while. Then we go on a much smaller plane and it takes about five hours and we get as far as Resolute Bay, which is the most northern airport, uh, commercial airport in Canada. That's where we get our gear and everything. And then we go on a much smaller plane another three or four hours north, and we go and we land on the sea ice near Alexander Fjord. Uh, and then we take a helicopter and then we're at our field site. So this is an idea that 
we're going fairly far north. We're about 80 degrees north, so we're quite far uh, in the Arctic. And this is what I've been recording ever since I've been there. This is what we've been trying to track is to, we don't have many, we're past tree line. You're not gonna do tree rings or some of the standard methods, but yet this is the most sensitive part for climate change. What will be driving climate change? Well, one of the things is sea, uh, just like sea ice changes, lake ice is also dramatically changing. This is the same lake under a cold year, a medium year and a warm year. Same water, same lake, but these are tremendously different conditions for the algae and the inverts, the, the organisms that live in a lake. In this cold scenario, because algae are photosynthetic like the plants around us, they need life. So pretty well the only place during a very cold year that can live is things that are in this very shallow moat area. As it gets warmer, deeper and deeper and all sorts of different types of organisms can start growing. So this is what I was gonna use. I did this with my PhD thesis way back then. This is what I'm going to use as a paleothermometer in the Arctic. And I'm only, the data we show are very difficult to look at, very hard even for us to look at. I'm not going to show too many. I'm going to show one or two profiles. But here's, here's how things have changed in the high Arctic. These are some of the earliest studies we did. Look at this in the high Arctic. By red, I put um, what I have here in red. Are uh, These are the organisms that are changing post-1850. Uh, for hundreds of years, we had these diatoms, like these small little fragilaria. So this is going back in time. Uh, this is going back in this lake, uh, it's going back about 8,000 years. For thousands of years, it was relatively stable with these cold water diatoms. Then since about the 18, post late 1800s, early 1900s, we see a tremendous change in diatoms to those that require less ice. We see this all across the Arctic. I'm just, I'm not, I'm just showing you these very summary diagrams but this is the type of information we're doing. We go back in time and we look at the fossils. Well, we did that work early on and we were some of the first to say that the Arctic has changed tremendously since the late 1800s, early 1900s. And we link this to climate warming. Now, we did this in the early 1990s when climate warming really wasn't sort of on the radar screen yet. Uh, but uh, it was very controversial at the time but now it's broadly accepted. But what we were able to show is that these these ponds in the high Arctic were permanent water bodies going back thousands of years. We also were able to show that in around the last hundred or so years, they've changed very dramatically consistent with accelerated warming. And uh, what's happened in these ponds over the last few years? That was the next question we asked. We know that they've been changing because of warming, but we also know the last 10 years or so have been especially warm what's happened to these ponds. And this is a quite a striking story. Uh, these are, this is one of the main study ponds we did up on Ellesmere Island. We called it Camp Pond. You can see the glaciers in the background. This is even before I was going up there in 1979. Someone took a picture of it, but it's not a big pond. It's about, you know, twice the size of my house, let's say in the surface area. It would be a pond, it would thaw, you know, the summer there is very short. Uh, it would thaw in June, July, and it'd be frozen up by late August, but it was a healthy pond. Here you can see that same pond in 1987, there's a younger John Small. You see the winter snow is already returned, still a very healthy pond. What's happened recently? Now by July, the pond has dried up. It's now, the summer is so much longer, so much warmer that these ponds that have been there for thousands of years, we know that from the paleo data, have disappeared. Here's the last few hours of that pond just a puddle left about the size of my desk. I went, this is two o'clock in the morning in 2006. I've been studying that pond for years. I put my hand in, these are all the little animals that were living in this entire pond and now concentrated in that puddle. A few hours later, it went dry. These are ecosystems disappearing. Here's a much, that was a small pond. This one's about the size of a football field. Uh, this is what it would look like uh, by the end of the year, at the end of the summer in 1987. Now, once we got into accelerated warming, even this pond is decreasing. Total ecosystems disappearing. What's happening since just in my lifetime is we're seeing temperatures going up. We're seeing ice cover. The lid is off. Once the ice is gone, the lid is off. Evaporation's increasing, water levels are declining, and even salinity is increasing. And we, we know it's evaporation because I've been measuring the salinity in those lakes every year 
And what happens when things evaporate, when things evaporate, the water level goes down and the salt goes up because water is evaporating, leaving the salt behind. I use the analogy that if I uh, put a pot of soup on the stove and I took the lid off on low heat, it's much like what these ponds are doing. If you watch your soup slowly, the soup level is going down as it evaporates. If you keep tasting your soup, it's getting saltier and saltier and saltier. That's because the salts are being left behind and the water is evaporating. That's exactly what we've seen. We've seen entire ecosystems disappear. The same things happened to the wetlands. This is what the wetlands look like there just in the 1980s. Now they're dead, they're dry. Uh, you can even put a match to them and they start burning. Uh, this is what happens when evaporation is higher than precipitation. So we're at the front end of climate change in the Arctic. We're seeing tremendous changes, entire ecosystems disappearing. Well, what's this got to do with us? Well, what happens in the Arctic, I say, you know, what happens in the North doesn't necessarily stay in the North. And this is just like an early warning system of what our things are happening here. So what about places like Ontario? Well, some of you who might go ice fishing now know ice fishing seasons are canceled. Uh, skating on lakes has been canceled. This, the lake ice is disappearing. But there's a lot of other things happening. And I refer to climate change as the uh, new threat multiplier. Virtually everything we deal with with climate change, when you look at other environmental problems in lakes, they're worse. And I'm gonna zero in on one that I know is of considerable concern to people in Southern Ontario, especially people in the Kingston area, the Rideau Lakes. And what I'm talking about is algal blooms. I know many of you have cottages or you like spending time angling or going swimming. And you might be wondering, why does my lake suddenly have algal blooms, especially cyanobacterial or blue-green algal blooms, which are especially severe? Well, no one wants that at their lake. And there's good reasons you don't want it. There's a lot of things, we call it cultural eutrophication, but there are a lot of things that happen when you get algal blooms. You have shoreline fouling, growth, toxins. Some of these algae actually produce things that, will, that can harm you health-wise. It can kill your dog if they drink the water. Taste and odor problems. Uh, when the algae dies, it kills the deep water fish. People don't want algal blooms. There's studies out there showing how uh, cottage properties, every the first time, as soon as you get an algal bloom, your cottage property drops. I forget how many thousands of dollars. It's, a, it's very closely linked to uh, recreational and industrial and in our use of drinking water, if nothing else. Well, why am I bringing up algal blooms? Because People, we thought we figured out algal blooms. Uh, you know, in the 1970s, before my time, people realized that nutrients, you add too many nutrients to a lake, you get an algal bloom. You add sewage to a lake, you get an algal bloom. That is perfectly correct. But what we're now finding, and you know, I wanna make clear, without question, what we found in the 70s was not wrong. You do need nutrients to generate algal blooms, but people are now recording algal blooms, even in lakes with no increase in nutrients, or even declining nutrients. Something has changed. And we're asking the question, can climate change be affecting these algal blooms even without the increase in nutrients? And this is where I come to what I refer to as, just like I talked in the Arctic, the longer summer, uh, we are seeing less ice cover in Southern Ontario. We're also seeing increased thermal stratification. What do I mean by that? If you're ever in a lake treading water in midsummer, sometimes your toes feel really cold, but you feel warm. And that's because the lake, because of the properties of water, it divides into three layers. Many of these algae like these stratified layers. So with the longer summer and the less ice cover and the warming, it's making a perfect storm for some of these algae. And I'll give you just one case study. I'll take you to Lake of the Woods. I don't know many of you know these lakes. It's almost one of the Great Lakes. Uh, it's got two provinces and one state. Look at that. They've done a very good job of decreasing phosphorus. Uh, this is supposed to be the main cause of algal blooms. And because of controls brought in by the government in the 1970s and the taking out phosphorus out of detergents, the, we've done what we were told to do and we were expecting to see decreases in algal blooms. Well, it worked for a while, but then starting up, especially when climate started warming, especially 80s, 1990s, what people are seeing, what's going on here? We've decreased the nutrients and yet we're still seeing algae. What's happening? Well, it looks like the lakes have completely changed linked to less ice and warmer temperatures. Again, I hate showing these, these are our fossils. This is just two of our fossils. 
This is going back about 100 years uh, in one of the bays of Lake of the Woods. But you can see how dramatically in fossils the lake changed in the 1980s. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here, but the algae that increased since the 1980s like less ice cover and they like warmer stratified conditions. The algae that were there before the 1980s don't like, uh, they like colder conditions, they like well mixed conditions and so on and so forth. How do we know this? Well, we can actually calibrate this. Uh, in green, I have the, the temperatures go back to about 120 years for this part of the world. In green, we have the annual temperature. You can see, if you look at this diatom, you can see how closely the diatom is actually tracking, the fossil diatom is tracking the measured temperature. Similarly, the diatom that likes cold conditions going inversely. We even have ice cover. This is how ice has been declining. Look at it when ice declining, how well the non-ice loving diatoms increasing. Look at how the ice loving diatom is, is uh, uh, decreasing along with ice cover. So we actually have a way of pushing the record back in time. So the lakes have changed dramatically because of climate warming. Have algal blooms happened at the same time? Is this linked to that? It looks like it has. Again, I don't like showing these, they're hard to see, but you need a certain amount of nutrients. Here's three scenarios, three bays. Um, as you can see, once you still fairly low phosphorus, all these lakes that have fairly low phosphorus are still have been increasing during that time in total algal bloom abundance. If you're really, really very low in phosphorus, you still don't see that change. But what's becoming clear is that we are seeing increases in algal blooms at the same time. And this is what's happening. We're, this is what the lakes were like before 1980s. They were cooler, well mixed. This is what the lakes have become now. What they've come is a stratified, warmer, less ice cover, and we're getting algal blooms even without further increases in nutrients. Not only are we getting algal blooms, we're getting blue-green algal blooms, which are the ones we're totally trying to avoid uh, because they cause all the extra problems. They're the worst of the algal blooms. You can get algal blooms of different types, but blue-green algae are the worst. And we can, we can link this now. What's happening is you're going to get these blooms now, we believe, even as nutrients are going down. On top of that, you're getting very abnormal weather. And you, if you live in Kingston, you know this. If you look at your insurance rates, you know this. We're getting what we call episodic weather, major storms. When you get these major storms, you don't have, you have a drought, and all of a sudden the rain comes in 24 hours, floods your backyard. That's also a great time to move all sorts of nutrients into a lake. Sometimes in one day, you can get as much nutrients going into the lake as did for the month before. So it's really now we have a perfect storm with climate change. Uh, you get this water flow going over the land. Uh, that goes, it ends up in the lake. Uh, and so now we're seeing with this episodic weather, the perfect storm of what's actually happening. So we've loaded the dice for the frequency of disasters, basically. Uh, and we don't think of it, you know, we don't think of algal blooms as climate change, but we are now that here's something that's happening in our backyards. And even though the climate's only warmed a little bit, it can have strong ecological repercussions. So I'm just going to end with a few slides here of just stressing how, uh, I believe the evidence for this is very strong. And I, I do refer to it as the fierce urgency of now. I quote Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this is uh, one of his famous quotes. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conundrum of life and history. There is such a thing as being too late. And I get somewhat frustrated with, I've been working on climate change for 30 years and uh, that I still hear that, oh, scientists still haven't decided on, on what's going on. Well, certainly science is never gonna be 100% understanding of all aspects of things like climate change, but there has been scientific consensus for some years. And I'm just gonna finish with uh, Dr. James Powell's analysis, which is a, a scientist. I just put this here, I have quite a lot of data here, but just to show, uh, this is Dr. James Powell. I just want to point, he's not like some, you know, some green piece or whatever, you know, what people say, oh, well, that's a, he's driven maybe perhaps by ideology. This is, this is a serious person. Uh, I'm not, I'm saying people <laughs> in environmental, I'm, I work with environmental groups all the time, as you know, but I mean, this is someone who uh, has all these degrees, has been president of all these universities, and he's been affiliated with Republicans. And for example, President Reagan and later President George Bush, both 
appointed him to the National Science Board. He's currently executive director of the National Physical Consortium. Uh, and what he does is he goes into the peer reviewed literature and says in the peer reviewed literature, what is the proportion of science that people publish in the peer reviewed literature that shows humans are causing climate change to those that say humans are not causing climate change. The last detailed analysis he did was in 2015. And he showed that of, uh, he, he did the comparison of, there was over 99% acceptance in the peer reviewed literature showing this. In fact, it, the ratio is 1,747 papers to one showing that climate warming is being caused by linked to humans and it's a serious problem. And I always ask, people say, well, you know, and then, I, then I look at the abacus poll says, one third of Canadians aren't convinced that scientists uh, have concluded that human infused uh, climate warming is happening. Well, one third of Canadians don't, somehow there's a disconnect between 1,747 to one and one out of three. Uh, I always ask, you know, if you had, if your daughter or your son was ill and you took them to 1,748 doctors and of those 1,748 doctors, 1,747 said your child needed some treatment, but one of 1,748 said everything was fine, who would you believe? Uh, so I think we have to start looking at some of those things. And we, 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 you know, it is an uphill battle for people in the climate change business. Uh, you know, we, you can spend 30, 40 years publishing in these top journals, and then suddenly you're in a media interview and you're, uh, uh, you're being, uh, you know, the discussion is going against some basement blogger who has absolutely no background, but quote, doesn't believe in climate change. Well, uh, this is not about belief, it's what you can show. And I'll just end by a quote that I always like from uh, Patrick Moynihan, a well-known uh, US uh, politician. Everyone's entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. And I think the facts have been in for some time and, it's a, and it is something that is, I would argue, the most important issue facing humanity today. So just like to thank all my colleagues and the Canadian government for supporting this work. Uh, and I'm certainly happy to take any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, here, just to un un share your screen room so we can see everybody. Uh, thank you. That, that was really, really thought provoking. We're going to we're going to get to the questions in a second. I just I think maybe just on behalf of some of the, the people who are here, um, I, I would ask you, I mean, besides trying to reduce uh, and maybe I already know the answer to this. I mean, besides trying to reduce the use of fossil fuels or get rid of the use of fossil fuels and reduce carbon emissions in various ways. Um, and also I'm understanding when you talk about nutrients going into the lakes, you're talking to some extent about agricultural fertilizer and things like that. Um, so what are some things that we can do, uh, we could do to uh, improve our, our lake situation? So yeah, well, with, when it comes to greenhouse warming, we got to stop putting carbon in the atmosphere. So uh, that that's that's the key, uh, we, and we got to do it fast. Uh, we're running out of options very very quickly. So uh, that's uh, whatever we you know. And people say, well, what can I do? I think everyone can do something. Um, you know, we have considerable power when it comes to carbon. Uh, we can do it by our own actions. Uh, for example, we can you know we can uh, just uh, not drive. Uh, you know, we, we, well, we all know what, what the different ways of, uh, on a personal level, we can do. Uh, we can also uh, do it with, um, uh, with our votes. We live in a democracy and we, uh, we can start demanding of politicians that we take this very seriously. The problem with often with environmental issues is uh, they're up there, but they're not typically the most important. Uh, on, on people's agenda. And I understand people are worried about their, you know, their mortgage and everything like that. But I think uh, the point is that what we haven't made a good case for is the environment drives everything. Uh, people talk, well, yeah, but there's the economy. The environment drives the economy. If you go to the cabinet table in Ottawa or in Toronto, you sit around the cabinet table, the environment is driving almost every cabinet position sitting there. It's driving agriculture, it's driving forestry, it's driving fisheries, uh, it's driving tourism, it's driving health, all these issues. So we have to stop talking about 
what's the cost of doing something, it's what's the cost of not doing something. Now, what this also means that if we're starting to get algal blooms, looking specifically at what I talked about here, it does suggest that the, the, the margins, we used to know approximately how much, there's always gonna be some nutrients flowing in from land to a lake. Uh, and where we had, you know, the lake can't go over say 10 parts per billion phosphorus. Well, with climate warming, we even have to lower probably those nutrient levels because now we're gonna get algal blooms when we didn't get algal blooms at that nutrient level because of the longer summer. So this means we have to even increase or probably decrease the amount of nutrients that can enter lakes. And that means, being more careful with, uh, well, with you know, with uh, any type of nutrient inflow, whether it be agriculture, whether it be from cottagers, all these cottagers who have these beautiful cottages with lawns going right to the waterfront. I mean, you know, they're fertilizing their lawns, and those that fertilizer is making its way into the lake. All this is affecting the ecosystem. So we've we've re as I put, you know, we have new dice. We've reshuffled the deck, if you like, um, and uh, uh, so. There, there are all these, these various issues, um, but it's complicated. I mean, I'm not saying this is, a, anyone who says climate is simple, it's not. <laughs> uh, but we don't have the luxury of not doing a lot. Uh, we should have been doing stuff for 30 years. And every year we have less and less of an option of what to do with it. Uh, Leslie, I'm wondering if you could uh, maybe read uh, some of the questions that people have been posting. Absolutely. Um, so a quick question from me first, John. Um, the lakes that are drying up in the Arctic, do they ever return? Is that it? Do they dry up temporarily for the summer and then come back or is they, are they gone for good? Yeah, so it depends. The big lakes are still there, obviously, but they just have receded shorelines. What were permanent ponds, many of them have become ephemeral ponds. So they do fill up with the snow melt, but then they disappear by July. The what used to be the ephemeral or the temporary ponds, they're gone pretty well. They've been what we call terrestrialized, um, at least the pond in my study area. Very quickly, they've been invaded by land plants. And now because they transpire and everything, they're, they're really transforming it to a, maybe first a wetland, but also into a terrestrial ecosystem. So we've got you know permanent water bodies that are much smaller. We got what used to be permanent bodies are now temporary bodies. And some of the temporary bodies are now dry land. Thank you. Um, okay, a question from Mark. Um, so for the problem of agricultural runoff, what edge of field techniques, et cetera, would ameliorate runoff best, such as ditching or, or planting of trees and shrubs? Yeah, so I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not an expert on the agricultural land, but there's different ways of plowing. Um, uh, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm getting a little outside my area here, but uh, the, um, uh, usually what we talk about is buffer strips are important. So uh, as much of a native vegetation as possible around the lake, because that will also decrease the amount of soils being eroded and also will take up nutrients before it gets into the lake. Uh, now there's other, and I'm not in, I'm moving outside my area, but when you actually add fertilizer, how much fertilizer you add, um, also letting uh, crops, um, you know, go um, fallow for a year, you know, to, to, to get the root structures going. But I'm going a little outside my area, but there is a whole field now of, of mitigating nutrient loss. And also you save money because nutrients cost money. <laughs> so, you know, adding fertilizer. Uh, so, but, but some of that could even be quite simple. You know, I, it drives me a bit crazy. I'm on these lakes and seeing these, these houses with these manicured, look like very much fertilized lawns to me you know, the lawn's going right to the waterfront. I mean, those nutrients, you know, it just all that nutrients is just pouring into the lake, so. And of course, the other thing is uh, keeping uh, um, sewage systems up to par, not letting other industries uh, introduce nutrients. Uh, you know, nutrients can come from industries as well. They come from leaking uh, sewage systems. All that has to be taken into account. Great, thank you. And I think that sort of answered another question about what cottage owners can do to, um, help um, the lakes and the shoreline. So that's great. Um, okay, here's a here's a fun question. Uh, my friend at NASA believes that science will invent solutions like removing carbon from the atmosphere. What do I tell him? Okay, well, <laughs> there is different ways of so-called carbon capture. <laughs> uh, it, I don't think too many people believe it's, uh, we, we are in such dire straits People say, you know, what's the silver bullet? There's no more silver bullet. We're, 
we got to do 10 things at once now. But one of them is uh, one of the methods is so-called carbon capture. And there's two types, debatably there's two types of carbon capture. And again, I'm going outside my area, but <laughs> two types. One is that if it's an industry like a carbon coming out of a pipe, it's captured, it's expensive, but they actually capture the carbon CO2 and some, they try and pump it, for example, uh, some of the um, fossil fuel industries, and they, they capture the carbon leaving, but then they use it to pump more fossil fuels out. They use it to pump it under, underground. But the idea is to get the, not let the carbon dioxide or the greenhouse gases go into the atmosphere. Uh, another way is just basically sucking out carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases from the, from the atmosphere. Uh, it, the technology is somewhat there. It's extremely expensive. That's one issue. Uh, so most people don't believe it's, um, it, it, you know, the technology will be there at a way to make it feasible enough to, it, it might be part of a solution, but I don't think too many think it's the solution. Uh, and it's, it's uh, the point is that we got to move very quickly here. <clears throat> Thank you, and I apologize, guys. I guess there's some feedback coming from me, so I'll, I'll make sure I mute when um, Don is answering the questions. Um, hopefully, you can hear me over top of the feedback. Um, so the next question is, can blue-green algae be collected and composted such that the danger of its toxicity is neutralized? Yeah, so not, not all blue-green algae will form toxins. Some do, and the ones that we know do don't all do it, so I should clarify that. Uh, it's a big, big problem collecting them. Now, I was in China where they have, now we think we have, <laughs> whenever I think we have problems, go to China water quality, you'll see something like orders of magnitude sometimes bigger. But I was at one lake where they have an industrial operation. They're actually sucking out the blue-green algae. It's a, it's a plant and they're trying to make fertilizer. I'm not sure how successful it is, but it's a fairly big operation, but the, the lake is still full of blue-greens. This is a, 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 you know, a big operation and, uh, the thing is, it's it's not really practical on any point, and it's not clear what's in that those blue green algae either. I mean, I've talked to some people that said, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 algae can pick up things like cadmium and stuff. There's some question whether uh, it would be the best thing to put for composting. I've talked to people who have argued that that it, it may have other issues. So it's not really a practical solution. The practical solution is not to get the blue greens blooming in the first place. Thank you. Um, next question is about water levels. Um, I've heard from my friends along Georgian Bay that the problem used to be low water and now it's high water. Is that um, a climate problem or how can that be explained? That's a, that's a very good question and one that is hard. Um, it, it, yes, so uh, water levels in the Great Lakes and other uh, lakes have fluctuated remarkably over the last few decades in comparison to long-term means. Again, this comes to sort of what we call the episodic weather as being one of the factors. So water levels in something like the Great Lakes will go up if you have more water. And the more water comes from either rain, snow or rain falling right on the lake, snow or rain falling on the land and going into the lake, or uh, the ratio of evaporation to precipitation. Those are the three things that are gonna drive water levels. It's true, only a few years ago, but less than 10 years ago, I'm going, I think it's less than 10 now, we had much, very hot summers, very warm, very high evaporation, and we had basically droughts. Uh, this is again what we call, you know, we're getting the extremes, the normals are gone, you know, and we had low water levels. What's happened since then is what's more, what I think people expect more, um, is yes, hot summer and evaporation, but there's more precipitation in this part of the world, it depends where you are. And what we've been seeing is more striking precipitation. Uh, and so even though evaporation may be higher, the, the, the flooding we have in Toronto as an example, or in my backyard a few days, <laughs> uh, that is driving the water levels up. So what's, what we're missing now is the old normal, and now we're going from one to the other. And it, I think most scientists believe it's gonna be mainly flooding in this part of the world, more precipitation coming. Thank you. Um, is there any way to change our recreational activities to decrease thermal stratification of water? Uh, no, you can't. You can't change the thermal stratification. We, our, our only way we can help deal with stratification is to change the climate, <laughs> or decrease the amount of CO two we're putting in the atmosphere. So, 
uh, we can't actually, uh, it's not practical to, uh, I mean, people have done it experimentally to trying to in the midsummer uh, mix the lake over, uh, but that causes other issues too. And it's just not practical to do that on, on many lakes, so. Great. Um, does road salt contribute to the algae issue? That is an issue. Road salt is a, what we call an emerging issue. I've actually worked around road salt in my work going back 20 years and no one cared about it. Suddenly now uh, there seems to be interest. <laughs> but yes, road salt uh, potentially could affect, certainly affects lakes. Um, and we've, we've already already published on some of that. Uh, certain, especially some of the little animals, the little animals that feed on algae, some of them are very sensitive to, uh, so uh, just to, to explain the road salt issue, uh, we put a road salt on roads, that road salt eventually goes in the water and ends up in lakes. So the salt levels in lakes are slow. If you're near a highway, you can show the salt levels are slowly going up, up, up. That is affecting, we now know several organisms potentially increasing the possibility of algal blooms. It has not been, um, uh, it is not definitive, but there is certainly some preliminary evidence that especially if some of the organisms that would eat the algae are gone or, uh, and it might even the blue greens might be more, uh, uh, more competitive, we say in a saltier environment. This is still very subtle salt increases, but it's not gonna help, I don't think. Um, here's a good question. How do you keep your upbeat demeanor? <laughs> I think a lot of us, uh, you know, dealing with climate issues, have a struggle with that. <laughs> well, it is a, I, yeah, that's a good question. I don't just deal with climate change; I deal with mining effects. I, I'm a deliverer of bad news. You know, uh, well, I, I'm optimistic still. I mean, as I say, the the fact I still rage means I still have hope. Uh, I think uh, it's a beautiful planet, a beautiful world, and I think we should do everything we can. Uh, to keep it that way. Uh, but it is a frustrating business at times. Uh, I sometimes think, you know, it's like the, the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> You're running just to stay in the same place because we keep adding new insults to the environment. So, um, but it is, uh, it's a very serious issue. And, um, uh, you know, and, and climate is just part of it. You know, I, it, it, we, we, we've got like, we've opened like Pandora's box of problems and, climate tends to make them, all the problems I've seen work on, climate makes them worse even. So we've got climate, which is a problem on its own. And it's like these, what we call synergistic problems, uh, making everything a little worse. So I, I don't want to sound too optimistic, um, but I mean, I, you know, I think all we have, uh, we only have one planet, let's fix it. Uh, <laughs> and time is running out. I mean, you know, that's why I put the Martin Luther King quote in there. There is such a thing as too late. We lose options. I mean, we're losing species. Once a species goes extinct, they're gone forever. You know, we do lose options. The longer we wait, there's less of the options we have available. Thank you. Um, can aeration help reduce algal growth? So there's different types of aeration. Um, again, this is not something. Uh, the, the aeration is done in lakes in very specific types of situations. And it's usually not so much for algal growth, but I didn't have time to get into it. But the other thing we're looking at, you have all these algae that are growing, algal blooms, when they die, they sink to the bottom. And when they sink to the bottom of the lake, they decompose. When they decompose, they take, they, they, uh, they use up oxygen. It's an oxidative process. So you lose deep water oxygen. When you lose deep water oxygen, that's when your deep water fish die. The deep water fish are the ones you typically like, trout and things like that. So there are these so-called aerators that are done in very specific, it's expensive and infrastructure. And they're just to like keep certain, often fishing clubs, let's say, <laughs> keeping their trout alive. But again, these things aren't really practical on the thousands and thousands of lakes that are affected. So again, we really have to deal with trying to keep climate warming from happening and trying to decrease the amount of nutrients entering the lake. Um. Approximately 1,500 new chemicals are introduced into commerce each year. How do chemicals affect the lakes? Well, yeah, and it depends what the chemical is. And this is, again, one of the issues we have. Uh, it's almost like you need to prove a problem with a chemical before anything's done about it, rather than the industry proving there isn't anything wrong with it before it's approved. 
So the onus seems to be on the environment uh, to deal with it. Um, and uh, we are producing all sorts of compounds and releasing them in all sorts of different ways. And you know, when we say in environmental science, be prepared for surprises. Uh, just for example, some compounds like we're used for you know, fire retardants, they ended up, they're moving in the atmosphere. They find them in polar bears now in the high Arctic. So, you know, they don't stay where, they, where you use them either. <laughs> Never mind the problems where you use them. They also volatilize and move thousands of kilometers. So uh, this again is just another issue that we have to deal with that um, we are constantly uh, loading the deck against the environment. And so it's serious. Thank you. Um, so we do have a few more questions in the chat, but um, we're getting down to our, our last few minutes. Unless people are really um, enthusiastic, I think we can stay a little bit longer. Um, but um, uh, so somebody asks, is the electrification of transport, such as cars and transportation vehicles, um, are we on the right path with that to reduce carbon in the air? Yeah, I think I think we are, but it depends where you get your electricity from. <laughs> Uh, so yes, uh, I think that's, well, that is the future, I think. And I think car companies know this. I mean, um, you know, we hear about Tesla, for example, but uh, you just look at the major car parties and we're going to be 100% electric in 10 years or 12 years. You just, the headlines just keep coming. Uh, uh, but it depends where the <laughs> electricity comes from. If your electricity is coming from coal power plants, uh, you know, you might feel very good driving your electric car, but you, you're, if the, the, the electricity came from a coal plant, uh, you still are contributing, you know, still, it, it, you have to have it fully audited, we say in the business. So, uh, you know, if you have your uh, electricity from renewable energy and you're driving electric coal, but that's definitely coming. And uh, that'll be one major point, but, you know, we got to move fast on that. And similar to that question, someone asks, um, with all the different technologies such as clean energy and electric cars and heat pumps, um, do you have a favorite <laughs> CO2, CO2 reducing action? Well, I think the favorite, you know, my favorite ones is, uh, is maybe what I already said, uh, by, by my own actions of trying to reduce my own carbon footprint, by my wallet being careful how I spend my money and ready to spend a little extra for something that didn't use a lot of greenhouse gases. And in a democracy, my vote <laughs> uh, to, uh, you know, we do have power, we just don't use it very effectively. Uh, politicians will listen, <laughs> you know, they will listen to their constituents, they won't get elected. So when, if you live in a democracy, you do have a tremendous power and you should uh, use it. And if you decide that the environment is a high priority for you, make sure your elected representatives know about it uh, and you'll get more action. But if you know politicians don't hear more about this and that and never hear about uh, this issue, well, it's not on their top of their radar screen, so. Thanks, and that, that answers someone else's question that was um, asking about, are we best to focus on political activity? Um, another direct, uh, direct question is, do mine tailings have global or just local impacts? And how about tar sands tailings? Yeah, so uh, tailings uh, in general are often tend to be a local issue, but uh, if they vault, what we say volatilize, um, they can enter the, uh, the airways. It depends what's there, what type of, there's so many different types of tailings. So it's very hard to just say tailings, but usually tailings are a fairly local issue. But if you go like, for example, in the tar sands or the oil sands, uh, not so much the tailings, but what comes out of different smokestacks, we know that can, uh, that can move quite a bit, certainly, you know, 100 kilometers and some compounds, you know, we, they're a global distillation, they go all the way to the Arctic. So, uh, but usually tailings tend to be more of a local issue. It's what comes out of smokestacks that is much more regional and to some extent global. Here's a question that's right up your alley. What is your advice for educators to incorporate effective science communication into our content? Well, I think, uh, I think uh, that's a very good question. I think um, there's a lot of good scientists around, but they're not always very good science communicators around, or they choose not to communicate the science. And I've been 
arguing for some time that we have to do a much better job of uh, getting the information that we do in universities and colleges and research institutes out to politicians and the public at large and policymakers. And I think the best way to do that uh, is to start doing it, but also to teaching or by, by example, I think, but also, uh, especially in university and high school, to start early and you know, explaining why communication is important and talking about communication. How do you communicate? How do you effectively communicate? How do you get your message out there? Uh, and I do, I, I do seminars on that. I just got invited to York University to do one on science communication yesterday, this morning, actually. So uh, I think this is a very important issue. Uh, and we haven't done a very good job at it. And a lot, there's a lot of reasons why we, you know, so I talked to scientists, like, you know, why don't you uh, just, you know, this is something in public and politicians know about. It's usually here, I don't have time. Well, you know, I think it's to our own benefit to make the time. I think we have to make the time for it. You hear that um, why not, one I like is, well, the public would never understand what I do. And I say, well, if you can't explain to an interested person what you do and why it's important, you probably don't understand what you're doing. Uh, and then another one is that uh, people, what will my peers think? Uh, will I be blowing my own horn? Well, it's not, you're not doing this to impress your peers. You're doing it to inform the public, a public which by and large paid for the research in the first place by their tax dollars. And then the last one is that it might get unpleasant. Well, yeah, I know. Uh, I can assure you, I deal with uh, oil sands and all sorts of things that I can tell you uh, it can get unpleasant. You know, sometimes you have to throw stones at giants. I'm just, uh, um, Leslie, I'm just gonna stop here for a second because it is it is eight o'clock and I'm, I wanna just briefly tell, because some people will wanna leave. We, it looks like we have a few more questions in the chat. Is that right? Um, but but uh, so so John has kindly agreed to stay behind afterwards to answer those. But I think I'm just going to sort of briefly um, just I will just want to talk about next week, um, and just say that uh, next week, February the eighth, we're having waste recycling and climate change with Dr. Myra Hurd, um, and uh, this is where we can talk about how we can reduce waste in a way that will help with uh, uh, dealing with climate change. Uh, so I look forward to seeing all of you then. But if you can stay around, uh, uh, John will, stay, will answer a few more questions. Uh, so um, anyway, see, uh, let's go back. Okay, John, uh, Leslie, got another one? Yep. Um... So should we be worried about access to clean or treatable drinking water? Uh, in, in Canada, <laughs> um, in urban centers like Kingston, I, I think our drinking water is, is, is quite safe. I certainly, uh, I am drinking tap water all the time. I'm not a big fan of <laughs> not drinking tap water. Uh, we have issues, of course, in some First Nations and Indigenous communities, and that is a serious issue. Uh, but I would say if you're in a, um, I, I do not have any problem uh, with drinking tap water at all. In fact, I, I'm a strong proponent of drinking tap water. Um, but we have to be careful. There's always things we're adding. <laughs> yeah, we don't, you know, uh, you know uh, things that we're, we're, we're learning about. And, you know, that's why you're keeping research going. But uh, I, I, I believe uh, tap water is safe. Great. Um, does the pH level of a lake can make it more or less vulnerable to algae blooms? That's a very good question. It depends on which algae, but um, uh, by and large, when you have a big algal bloom, you tend to change the pH. Uh, so so let, me, let me recast that. Um, acid rain did not cause algal blooms. Uh, in fact, acid rain lowered pH, and in fact, it killed so many algae uh, that uh, the lakes looked quite clear. You know, I, I always say sort of somewhat, uh, somewhat jokingly, if acid rain didn't kill fish, no one would have cared, you know, because, oh, look at how clean my lake is now all of a sudden. But um, so, uh, but what happens when, um, uh, when algae do bloom, they tend to raise the pH, it's got to do with the, the chemistry, uh, then it can change the pH again, but it's not so much a pH, it's the algal bloom doing the pH changing, not so much pH causing the algal bloom, if that makes sense. So it's, it's, it's not so much as a trigger for, for an algal bloom. 
Great. And the, the last thing I have in here is actually a bit more of a comment, but um, Mark would like to add to your list of things that you should do a fourth item, which is that is how you invest your money. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got count that under my wallet, but yes, <laughs> how you spend your money, how you invest your money. Uh, and we're, you know, we're dealing with that in universities, pension plans, for example. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, if we, yeah, uh, I think that that is all another way of, of making the difference. And I just like to um, point out that there are many messages of thanks and for your good talk and for your good answers to the question. So on behalf of everybody, thank you very much for that. Oh, happy. Happy to do it. And I second that, John. Thanks very much. That was a really great talk. Thank you very much. Well, happy. Take care. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. Good night to all, and we'll see you next week. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye. <laughs>